What's up guys, Swift here covering everything Chicago Bears with daily videos and updates. I spent over an hour last night talking to Jordan Silvera where we go in depth discussing both the Roquan Smith trade a little bit, then we go full in depth on the Chase Claypool trade. I do want to apologize as I was editing this video this morning, I noticed I had a couple mic issues last night. Throughout this video, there are a couple times where my mic is going to go in and out. I don't know if I was setting maybe lean back a little bit too far. Jordan did not have any problems hearing me, but as I was editing the video over this morning, it drove me nuts how much my mic went in and out. So I apologize to anybody who watches this and doesn't like how my mic sounds during this conversation. I promise it'll be much, much better next time. Not something I normally have an issue with. I don't know exactly what happened last night, but that being said, we talked for over an hour and Jordan makes some incredible points in here and we talk about a lot of great stuff. So I do still want to release this video and let you guys know I also have an All-22 coming out on Chase Claypool and I got the All-22 coming out on the Chicago Bears and I got a couple little surprises as well. Hit the like button for me guys and stay tuned. What's up guys, Swift here. I got my boy Jordan Silvera in the building. We're talking Chicago Bears. There's been a lot of stuff go down the last couple of days. Trades galore. We've shipped Roquan Smith out of town. We have now acquired Chase Claypool. And Jordan, go ahead and introduce yourself and then we'll we'll get right into this. Of course, Swifty. As always, thanks for having me on. Uh, audience, appreciate you hanging out. Talking Chicago Bears, you can find me at Jordan T. Silvera on Twitter and excited to talk about this Claypool trade and the departure of Roquan Smith. Yeah, I think that's what um, I kind of want to talk about first is fans kind of shifted a little bit. I'll mention that first. Is Chant, when we traded Roquan, they were jumping off a cliff. I had people commenting on my thing. They were done. There were just so many comments, probably 15 or so of people just saying, I'm done. Like, this was it. Like, we're traded away our best player. I can't do it. And then after we got Claypool today, those same people came back. We're like, I'm back, Swift, my bad. Like, no, like, I mean, we we got a weapon for Justin Fields now. So let's first, let's talk about kind of when I look at how it went down overall, what I think happened. Is Eberflus and Ryan Poles, they looked at the tape and what they have in Roquan Smith, and it came down to two things. Like, one, they didn't think they were going to be able to work out a long-term deal with him what they needed and two i don't think he fit exactly what they wanted to do. system defense and even said i can get a guy for a lot cheaper and do the job what are your thoughts on that i think that you and i see eye to eye on that i mean the reality of the situation is you have to look at the off-ball linebacker position and realize that in today's nfl the modern league it's a devalued position you can find them a dime a dozen there's a reason you pull a Jack Sanborn in the UDFA class and he fills in and is relatively solid. There's a reason for some, whatever reason you want to chalk it up to, Nick Morrow looks more competent in this scheme. He looks good. He looks good. I mean, you you look at Dallas. We just got done playing Dallas. Leighton Van Der Esch, I know he's a former first round pick, but this is really the second part of it and why I think I agree with you here, Swifty, is that you now have eight, nine games of film to review. And this has always been, and I know I got so much shit back in the day because I was like, hey, trade Roquan for whatever you can get in the offseason. And people looked at me like I was crazy. I understand it's a personal thing, but I don't see where you can plug a six-foot linebacker in a one-gap downhill attacking scheme and ask that six-foot linebacker to face guards and tackles and centers that are 6'3 and outweighing them by 100 pounds. There's a reason Leighton Van Der Esch is 6'3", 6'4". There's a reason Fred Warner is 6'3", 6'4", Demario Davis. You can't make this guy work. Shaq Leonard is a long condor of a linebacker. And Roquan Smith's game has always been, put the big hog mollies in front of me, let me roam sideline to sideline, and then if I have a blocker coming at me, I'll juke him out and I'll backdoor the block. Or exactly. That's what I've do seen. That here. I've seen it on tape this year when I watched it actually said it a couple times it Moro shows you how you should get a block fill a gap in the run mm -hmm. game. and then Roquan Smith get lost he gets lost in the he hits a blocker he is he's washed like there's 
so shedding that blocker. That's it's a losing business model, Swifty. You're six foot two thirty, and like this sounds like I'm a hater on what I'm not. Yeah, I was gonna say that too. It's not like because I, I kind of agree with you. What Jordan's saying is not that he's hating on Roquan. Just this system that Eber flew that position specifically have to play it a certain way. Also, the other like X factor turnover, forced fumbles, things that want from that position because they're they're supposed to be defense buds too. So you should be able to get those. Like everyone wants to say, well, he's the lead. Tackler in the NFL right now. Jesus, so part is Blake Martinez. Part of the yeah, part of that is because of this defense, though, and the position he plays. It puts him in that position. He's actually missed so many plays. Just the first drive against the Cowboys. I watched that last week. Roquan just nowhere to be found that entire drive. Got burned on a in coverage, washed on every run play. Just, I think we both think that Roquan. Very talented. I think we both think that Roquan's a very talented linebacker. He's going to do very well in Baltimore. But I think this is one of those rare cases when, because our team right now, he definitely could use weapons on offense. Roquan's fit on defense paired with him not being worth the contract or not being able to work out with polls. Just a win win. I mean, because you have to consider this, Swifty. The reality is, not only are you hoping that you can come to a, an agreement on an extension, this guy believes he should set the market, and his play shows nothing of the sort. How can I possibly sign a devalued position? You want to know what that looks like? Look over to the Indianapolis Colts and see what Chris Ballard looks like when he's all of a sudden assigning money to Shaq Leonard, who's not been playing, and Quentin Nelson, a guard who looks okay, Ryan Kelly, a right tackle. He's about to have to pay Jonathan Taylor. This is what happens when you decide to plant flag posts in the ground of this is a key financial investment. I'm going to put it into an off-ball linebacker that doesn't live up to the billing. And this is what I'm saying. It's I know it sounds like I'm negative on, on Roquan Smith. We can talk about what he's going to look like at the Ravens, and I think he's going to look very good. But, I mean, one thing I'd love to kind of talk about a little further is, I, know there's, I mean, we can talk about Hogan Johns and a few others that love to sit there and say, Man, well, this is a good sign that this is why you don't take a linebacker at number eight overall. And I completely disagree with that. I think context is important. When you go back and look at the Roquan, Pitt, Roquan Smith uh, draft pick, I don't have any issue with it. When you consider it was just off of getting your elite edge rusher in Khalil Mack, second year of Mitch, you've hired the new coach. Vic Fangio is the guy that N Nagy's going to ultimately ride the coattails off of. And this is Vic saying the last piece I need to make this defense work is my off ball middle linebacker opposite Danny Trevathan, who's a lot more mobile, can go sideline to sideline. He'll let Akeem Hicks and Eddie Goldman eat the blocks and then he'll fill and spill or he'll spill and fill on it. And that's the last piece I need. So I don't have a problem with Ryan Pace because a lot of people are going to say, well, Ryan Pace screwed us again. I don't have a problem with dropping that final piece in even at a devalued position it just doesn't work in hindsight when your championship window didn't really exist. It was somewhat fraudulent. And I am so happy that Ryan Poles is not feeling like, well, I have to do right by this player when he hasn't shown me anything of the sort. I mean, the value was incredible. I, I, we can certainly talk about that. The, the, the value that, and I know so many Bears fans, as you said, we're ready to jump off the cliff. Those are the fickle ones. And I'm, I mean, hey, welcome back to the bandwagon. I'm not here to, <laughs> to shun you away, but... When you consider what position he is, the play level, the fact, I'm, I mean, I'm, I told you I was in Dallas for the game. I'm sitting there enjoying my last day in Dallas at a restaurant, and I see the ESPN ticker pop up, and they're saying Roquan Smith was traded for a second and a fifth. And my wife's sitting across from me, and I'm just going giddy, jumping, jumping around because I couldn't believe. Yeah, I could. I couldn't believe that Poles was able to somehow swindle Eric DaCosta and the Ravens to give him a second and a fifth. I talked about this for a minute in my video. I had recorded a video that, that morning, right? And I was editing it on Bears Trade Room. And I was addressing whether or not they'd trade him to the Ravens. And I was saying, guys, that's not going to happen. I'm glad the video didn't come out, but I was basically going to say, not going to happen because I just didn't see the Ravens 
trading one their team in a salary cap issue that is trying to sign Lamar Jackson. Now they have two guys wanting to be the highest paid players at their respective position. One of them's quarterback, one of them's off ball linebacker. Neither of them has an agent, and they have about forty million in cap room. I'm sure, they can make it work. All types that you can get the cap, whatever. But if they do that, they're gonna hurt their flexibility for the next five, six years. Not, and that's gonna be what they're going with. Oquan Smith, R. Jackson, got Mark Andrews, we got Ronnie Stanley, like got a couple guys. This is our squad in this world. It's just to me, it was a shock. Like I was initial, like it was it was shock value. I was traded Roquan. I was thinking a second and that was it. Maybe a second and a player. Like maybe. But I getting, was thinking third. Yeah. And that's third what, is the best you'll get. I was thinking, yeah, and that's where getting a second and also getting a fifth, great deal. I got a fourth for Robert Quinn, so he added a fourth, a fifth, and a second. Flip a second for Claypool. I mean, because just think about this, Swifty. Like, because, I mean, I, look, I don't mean to, like, become public enemy number one with the Bears fans, but I got to flip it on them. You all want to sit there and kiss Ryan Pohl's feet for drafting Brisker and Gordon. And you're mad that he only got a second or a fifth or, or a fourth for Quinn. If keep that same energy, if you really believe in this GM that he knows how to scout and pick up talent late in the draft, and so far it looks like he's showing some of that with these picks, then you shouldn't have a problem with him getting a second round pick and not a first. I think because a lot of people he should be able to pull the good talent out of the pool, right? Yeah, and I think a lot of people were overwhelmingly happy with it. Actually, I was. There were that there was there's always that you know had so many positive comments. People actually, they loved where this was going with the extra draft picks. But I mean, that definitely swung around today after we faced Claypool. Got Justin Fields a weapon. Like talk, we probably talk about Roquan Smith all night, but Roquan's gone. He's a Raven now. <laughs> the guy, I really want to talk about face Claypool. The guy who this is the part two. So many fans loved Chase Claypool. A couple years ago, took Cole Komet, Chase Claypool was on the board and went kicker a couple picks later. Mm -hmm. Fans wanted Claypool. Now, got Claypool and Komet, Harry, and Darnell Mooney, David Montgomery, Herbert, and holds on that offense. And suddenly, this goes from a team where all the narratives said we had no weapons. Now we're a team that, in my opinion, I think we dangerous. What do you think about the Claypool just outlook of our offense? I mean, Swifty, I was giddy jumping around at work today as I read the news, and I was late to it, but this is, I mean, you know me, we've talked. This is not something that just kind of, I was on like a day or two ago. This has been weeks in me posted, like, if Ryan Poles really wants to do right by Justin Fields, there isn't really a conversation. And I'm not telling you that Denzel Mims is nearly as good as Chase Claypool. But this is what it comes down to is it's the archetype. No matter how much you love Darnell Mooney, his vertical is getting to chase Claypool's head before the arms are stretched out when he's trying to reach up and grab. You need a guy that can go up and contest at the catch point and win at the catch point for Justin Fields so that he can have the confidence to drop a bomb over there and not have Valus Jones drop it in his fingers. Or have Darnell Mooney have to do the impossible in, in Minnesota and find a way to like bat it back to himself to bring it down. Or having asking Equinemia St. Brown to be that guy. And everybody can say, well, this is where, and I'm I look, I, I hope Nikhil Harry shuts me up and proves me wrong. I wasn't a fan of the move. See, I I I, I like Nikhil Harry, but I will say Claypool's a different dynamic. It's different. Where That's the point. I, I think actually Pairing them together in the same offense, you're going to get more out of Nick Perry now as well. Because what I see now, I actually a balanced offense. Whereas before, just had Darnell Mooney, and then to kill Harry, going to, whatever he provided, going to be a bonus because we didn't have a big target. Equinemius like St. Brown, he just didn't that guy. He's big, doesn't use his body to his Correct. advantage. If you're not boxing out the cornerbacks, and you're cutting up field and letting people cut you off, what's the point of having that big body? That's one thing where Nikhil Harry 
does give us that in this offense. Saw it last week when he got his first touchdown as a bear. Good to see it was just right over the middle on a cross. Hit him in the chest. He bodied out the cornerback. Touchdown. And now have an X face Claypool. Big. He's 6'4", 238, Yeah, okay. So 6'4", 238, just monster of a player as your X Then you got Darnell Moon, right? Where he's been, everyone's like, well, Moon hasn't, the reason why he hasn't done anything. Defenses are aiding their higher coverage. Now, that's going to have to go to Claypool. Like, Mooney's not that guy anymore. Then, Bill Harry is now big bot receiver. And that's the offense I see. Because this is exactly what you're talking about, and, and you're kind of serving it up to me because you're dancing around it here. That is the big difference. I have no problem with Nikhil Harry as a player, but he lacks a key a key ingredient of what is what makes so many offenses dangerous, speed. He can box out. He can be a guy that wins at the catch point. But is it going to be 40 yards down the field, or is Justin Fields going to be sacked because it took so long to get down there? Yeah, no, true. Chase Claypool provides the opportunity to say, look, I'm just as big as Nikhil Harry, but I can stack and shed you because I run low four fours. And if you want to go ahead and place cover one double on Mooney, or you want to, you know, play cover six there and leave me on the cover on the uh, on the not on the quarter side, but on the cover two side. Watch me stack and shed your corner, and I'm going to make you pay for sh- for moving everybody over there on Mooney. And then, oh great. Well, is it just that he can play outside? No, let's go ahead and put Nikhil Harry outside. Yep. And then let's put Chase Claypool on the inside and let's wrap him run the slot fades. Where yeah. you're running those, you know, even those switch verticals. Where sure, I'll put I'll put Nikhil Harry across on that little slant, have the slot fade up with Chase Claypool. Claypool, Charlie Claypool from the slot on the fade and having yep. Harry that's beautiful. And that this is, is the thing, like it, it's this isn't imaginary. You can go back and look at Chase Claypool. And you know that guy that all the Bears fans wanted, George Pickens? Oh, my God. He tracks the ball so well. He always finds it. He goes up and gets it. There is visual proof of Chase Claypool. Claypool's ball tracking. Tracking the ball. Oh, my God. Through cornerbacks over top, over his shoulder. Like, there was one, I I believe it was this year. Where, Against Tampa Bay. Yep, in the Tampa Bay game where mm-hmm. where he where he go he goes – um goes horizontal and yep. the the corner the ball goes like right through him and he's he's looking up at the ball like locked on it through the cornerback and ca- that was one of the that's one of the most beautiful i'll probably throw it up on the screen talking here yeah i mean there was one i don't know if it was mason rudolph or big ben it was a preseason game and he actually ended up getting hurt on it not severely came back a week later but this deep ball and he tracks it all the way down stretches out for it comes down with it Recovers it through, catches it through through contact on the ground, ends up rolling his shoulder. Like this is the thing is when you're talking about Valus Jones being the guy, Mr. Butterfingers at the moment, who can't find a way to hold on to it. That's not this dude. It's I mean, to me, it's special. And 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 I understand that it sounds rich. I'll even play Kate Bears fans a little bit and say on a personal level, I was on record saying I wouldn't give more than a third for Claypool. And it's because, of, look, I mean, and we can talk about this is the Roquan, this is all the trades that happened today, most trades on a trade deadline in the NFL history. Trading in the NFL is fickle. You have Amari Cooper, who's a better receiver than Chase Claypool's ever been thus far, for a fifth-round pick. He's also $20 million, but it's a fifth-rounder. Why does Roquan Smith get you more trade uh, value or assets in return than Khalil Mack does, despite the fact that Khalil Mack plays a more valuable position and is better at his position than Roquan Smith has ever shown you? It's because the NFL is fickle. So I understand and I can complain that, damn it, why did we have to give a second-round pick? It's a cup, but the context is the key here, Swifty. Like, as much as I wish that they didn't give a second-round pick, understand that Green Bay was competing for him. Understand that if you didn't get him, Aaron Rodgers was going to be dropping those dimes to this monster that's 6'4", 238. I think that is a factor in this, and that's one thing that um, we, we spoke about this. Us having a view from around the NFL of our roster – our draft pick being valuable, whereas the Packers still view could make a playoff run, even though we have the same record right now. That is the reason why I believe we got Chase Clayton. 
obviously I don't know if we'll ever know that for sure. Packers were interested. I, I mm-hmm. believe that's I believe that a hundred percent. Way too many reports out there that the Packers were posing it. You look at it from an outside perspective, it's kind of easy oh, what happened. Kind of put the piece together. He had the Ravens second round pick. Did offer that, right? The Packers are offering their pick. We're offering the Ravens second round pick head on, right? Like both of those teams are off teams, especially if the Packers are pick valued higher. And I think that's why Ryan Poles had to make it our pick. That's why a lot of fans kind of switch base a little bit. They're they're not as happy that it's our pick, not the Ravens. But when it comes down to it, if we win a few more games, went out this year, our picks could be very close. Everyone can continues thinking we have a top five pick. Ravens pick's going to be in the 20s, 30s. You don't know that. I mean, if Lamar gets hurt or something, their pick could be way higher than ours. There's a lot that goes. Absolutely. And to me, it's that's just one layer of this. When you consider the fact that so many Bears fans, I, I think, are missing this point that we can talk about Calvin Ridley and the fact that he won't be playing until next year, or, man, we should just draft Quentin Johnston in the first round or X, Y, or Z. This allows you to get a rare talent, a rare potential archetype. There are not many guys that are 6'4", 235, 240, that run low 4'4", four, four, high 4'3". Four, four, and, and this is the thing. Wait, is, and one I mean, more yes, point. Like, Wait a minute. You know yes. what Ryan Poles loves? You've seen his RAS score? 9.98. I mean, Ryan well, Poles, is, I mean, you can't tell me Ryan Poles didn't see that. I mean, Swifty, this is the thing is, I mean, look, and I understand it's so easy to go. Well, last year there was Alec Pierce and George Pickens in the second round. I was high on both. That was also the deepest draft class of all time. I understand Chase Claypool was there in the second round, but not every draft class has these big athletic X wide receivers there for the picking in the second round. It does it does happen more often. I mean, you do think, I mean, with Quentin Johnson in the draft and Cedric Till, there is a chance that one of those guys are there. But what you don't want to do as a looking at next and potentially spending a ton of money on a draft pick, hoping your quarterback going into his third year can make a bigger step, be a playoff team. But at that point, you don't want to pigeonhole yourself going into the draft where I have to take a wide receiver because the free agent class is weak. That can't be overlooked right now. Sure, Ryan Poles thinks about the whole picture. That's something that a lot of Bears fans don't do. And they, I mean, they just can't see the whole picture. It's hard sometimes, but Ryan Poles knows certain spots in the roster he has to attack by next year. And he can't predict all the free agents are going it. When you look at the talent at other positions, offensive line, defensive tackle, edge rusher, it's all there. Even linebacker, they're linebackers. Not guys, maybe they're not as quite as talented as Roquan. Give me Tremaine Edmonds to come in here, linebacker, and I'm going to be happy. There's just guys all over the place. Look at wide receiver, you're like, oh, it's the same guys from this year, Jay Char. Nelson Aguilar. Yeah, Nelson Aguilar, Odell Beckham. Nobody that's a difference maker that can come like Chase Claypool is, especially that fit size and physical aspect and dynamic size, speed, ratio, all that. Chase Claypool checks all those boxes. Nobody in free agency. And nobody wants to consider the fact that, look, you get this chemistry building started early. Justin Fields has to wait until April of May next year if you're drafting a receiver to be the Chase Claypool mold. Oh, well, we should have got Calvin Ridley. Yeah, I mean, cool. He doesn't get to practice or even build chemistry with Calvin Ridley until next year whenever he's reinstated. And he's 29. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing is you get the opportunity. And I'm not even telling you Claypool comes in and all of a sudden starts dominating. He's got an offense to learn. But that chemistry building starts tomorrow and you just start stacking the good days. And if Nikhil Harry so can come back, and, that, yeah, yeah, and if Nikhil Harry can come back in two weeks and and catch a touchdown, what does it look like? And because this is the thing is, I'm not asking Claypool to learn the whole playbook. I'm saying, hey, it's a goal line fade. Hey, it looks like cover one. We're going to put you on the go route. I'll design him a package. Command? Yeah, you know, hey, got, got him a you package just, of five to ten plays. Up? Yeah. Can you just stack and shed the guy? I mean, you're 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 six four two forty. Can you beat the press and then use that speed to get over the top? Don't worry about the rest. Just run a go route because you know Justin's going to pin it to your chest. And it's it's 
And when you, I'm glad you mentioned Nick Perry there. I talked about him a little. I just, just believe the whole dynamic of this offense actually chemistry. But that's what we have to look forward to the rest of the season. When Roquan got traded, a lot of people hopes were just kind of like, well, the season's over. Now we have jit weapons on offense, Justin Fields to build chemistry and start. No, just start getting this offense together. For it's gonna look, I believe, it's gonna take a couple weeks. Like like you said, Claypool, I think he can come out, play twenty to thirty snaps, this week. maybe even get five to six targets, get a couple manufactured touches because he can do the jet sweeps too. He yeah. can do all the things that Valus Jones can do, and maybe he doesn't have quite as fast as Valus Jones. He's bigger and more physical. Got 25 pounds and about four inches on him. Almost as fast, like the 442, the 43. Mm-hmm. So, what's your thoughts on not only how he fits in this offense, but what this offense is going to look like with Claypool out there? I mean, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, because it wouldn't quite, you wouldn't be having me on here if it wasn't quite a little bit of a Jordan Silvera theory, but. And I'm not here to, to rain down on the Chase Claypool stuff. I think we've, you know, talked and, and waxed poetically about him for a while now. But I I will never call Chase Claypool a wide receiver one for just a real quick definition. To me, it's very subjective, but to me, a wide receiver one is a guy. It's Michael Irvin is the perfect definition of it, a playmaker. When I absolutely need you to go get me a bucket, when I need you to win, it doesn't matter the circumstance, doesn't matter the route, doesn't matter the situation, doesn't matter the, the weather, the time of the game, you will always find a way to come down with the ball for me. That's a wide receiver one. And I love Darnell Mooney. Hasn't shown me that. I'm not even ready to tell you that Chase Claypool is that. But this is the the weird strength there I've got kind of going on here. I will certainly concede I'm not sure that Chase Claypool can't be that because I don't think we've seen him with a guy as dynamic as Justin Fields at quarterback because it was the end of career Ben Roethlisberger. But right now, I do definitely feel confident in saying Chase Claypool to me looks like a wide receiver 1.5. Just like I can honestly say, Darnell Mooney is better than a wide receiver two, but he's just not a wide receiver one for physical limitations. It's also but he's kind of like a one point five. I think it goes with like what the offense is. Like there's prototypes. There's mm-hmm. can you be the number one weapon in this offense, have success, and what Chase Claypool like to meet this offense, our number one wide receiver, whether yep. or not. That's whether or not he's, his stats are going to compare to DK Metcalf. Who cares? But guy, who, I'm in. Be the extra. I mean, he's a guy who you get, get 100 field. targets a year, stretch the field, four double digit touchdowns. He has all that potential. And he's a Chicago Bear. And man, I'm. Because woof. this is what it is is that if you have these two guys that are wide receiver 1.5s, and I know that's like, it sounds cutesy and gimmicky, but I'm not trying to be. But you have this situation where you have one guy that's a physical freak, Mapletron as they call him, because of that size. And look, he's not going to be Mr. Super Shifty Dante Pettis, Darnell Mooney, because of that weight and that size to be able to do all these multi-cuts. Violent but if, and physical. Ryan he's Paul physical, said it too. violent, yeah. attacks the catch point, goes up and wins you balls, and he can stretch the field, which is what Justin loves. Let me go ahead and drop and pin that ball on your chest. And then if you want to go ahead and roll your coverage to him, I'm just going to go to Darnell Mooney, the guy that put up a thousand yards with the, with the shell or the husk of Allen Robinson last year. That's what the, I, I gonna think fans you up. how much better it's Darnell. Because when defenses pay attention to a guy and they can't roll coverages to Mooney's mm-hmm. proven his chemistry with fields is only gotten better. Mooney's a guy who's going to damage. Well, because this is the thing, Swifty, what does it do for Darnell Mooney? If he doesn't have to be the X, if he doesn't, I mean, this is the thing, like, it, it sounds like, oh, I'm so down on Mooney. Mooney actually does a great job, despite his diminutive size, winning at the catch point. Oh, yeah. I mean, he had it's one. Been impressive. Fan, yeah. I he mean, had one at the, the fan fest where he, he like just straight up. Oh, yep. to do. Yep, I remember that one. Yep. It was yep. on the sideline. Yep. Yeah. And he had, he had obviously had the one in Minnesota where he's just moss and the guy. So. He can, I mean, Terry McLaurin, I know it's a separate topic, but he had one this week where he's just like, this is my city, and took it over the Washington corner. That's what Darnell Mooney can do, but it's different. You don't want to like, throw, you don't want to rely on them. 
yep. Chase Claypool's a guy. They're not always going to be one-handed and look like that because he doesn't need to do that. When yep. Mooney goes up and catches something like that, he's only 5'10", so like, got to do that, whereas Chase Claypool can just go up and catch it like this. Well, that's why I was making the joke to you. Like, yeah. as much as Darnell Mooney wants to jump, he can jump as high as he wants on a vertical jump. And even with his arms, his, his arms stretched out, he's maybe an inch or two above Chase Claypool's head. Like, and yeah, the problem. Claypool. And so what is it, what does it look like when Chase Claypool's that guy and now Darnell Mooney can win you some of those balls that he does from time to time, but also can be that shifty Z wide receiver that he is much more naturally a fit of. That's where I believe the X factor then of the offense down to if Nikhil Harry can provide you the power slot, does some power slot, some damage from that power slot on crossers, get him on the quick screens, trying to give to Mooney earlier in the year. Way better if you got Mooney side hitting him over there. And then you got instead of having Cole Komet or one of those guys who were missing blocks earlier in the year, Dante Pettis or Mooney, you got Chase Claypool in front of you. That and he guy's becomes, a beast. He becomes that the, he being the kill Harry becomes that condensed receiver that plays in that Cooper Cup role where he's so close to the line of scrimmage. He can chip block those edge defenders he can insert himself as the blocker that everybody was so hyped about when he was acquired. And now it's just, it, this is what I'm talking about is this has been so desperately missing. And Justin Fields has had to be a Superman captain, save an offense because you now have the ability to say Dante Pettis doesn't have to be a starting receiver on the outside. He can be that shifty route running merchant on the inside in a quads look, or if we want to pop out Nikhil Harry and use Dante Pettis there, oh, now we want a little more size and power. We can pop Nikhil Harry in there. It opens up the permutations for that room in a way that was simply missing. And it's not just because the name is Chase Claypool. This is what we were talking about at the beginning. It's the archetype. They were missing a guy that was 6'4". Well, Nikhil Harry is 6'4". But a guy that's 6'4", that has the true speed to take the top off. You have to be able to take the top the off the defense. Respect. Yeah, that's not what Nikhil Harry was doing. What Nikhil Harry was doing. Dynamic big slot receiver. But he was actually having to play the X because have an X. Whereas now, he's going to get to go. He can true. Ace Claypool take attention off of everybody, including our run game. Like, if, if teams want to keep packing eight men in the box now, and we got Mooney on one side, Claypool on the other. Bring it. Justin Fields mm -hmm. is going to launch some deep flies a couple times a game. Because this is something I've been desperately begging for, and I've told you this before in direct messages and things of that sort, is you, when you have a quarterback with that big arm like Justin Fields, big arms need big bodies to pin them to. And they haven't had a guy like Claypool. We can talk about Cole Komet and Nikhil Harry and Equinemia St. Brown. Look, I'm sorry, but those guys have never, ever even sniffed the athletic dominance that Chase Claypool possesses. And like I said, he hasn't reached his ceiling. We will see what that looks like. But you were paying that hefty price for the potential. There is not an Alec Pierce, a George Pickens, some athletic freak, some DK Metcalf light. In the draft, in free agency, I'm sorry, Alan Lazard is not that guy. Maple is that guy, and that's that's you why are it's getting exciting. Maple Trump. Yeah. Maple that, that's Trump. why I don't really care which pick we. I'm glad that Ryan Poles saw what most of us fans already saw as well that we need big physical receiver to help Justin Fields progress and to help his development over next year. Being able to get him this year. I mean, my biggest hope was we brought in someone next year in the draft. I obviously have I've talked about trading for Claypool. After we shipped away Roquan, I thought we were, we were more likely to ship away David Montgomery or Eddie Jackson or to trade for Claypool because I figured he was shifting into full rebuild. Like, this sucks. Go ahead and rebuild. But what he did is they brought in a linebacker that I think, I think A.J. Klein, they might actually have plans to play him. They think he could be on this team. I'm hoping Sanborn Weatherford gets shot. Yeah. But I mean that's that's well, the biggest <laughs> thing. I mean, Claypool is that guy. He scratched off our biggest need, in my opinion, going into the offseason. Now we have other needs 
Yeah, we need some talent on the tackles. And we could use talent on offense. It gives us time to evaluate the guys we have here. Can Braxton be that guy? Can Borum be that guy? What's going to happen with the rest of the guys on the line? We don't know, but Claypool takes... Basically, we're not going to pigeonhole ourselves in the... Well, that's, that's exactly what it is, Swifty, is that it is so valuable to say... I don't have to show my cards to the rest of the league and how I'm going to play this. Yeah, because hate doing that. Added, because... Yeah. I mean, it, it, as you said, it pigeonholes you. It locks you down. And, I mean, look, I, I am always very, very wary about committing assets, money, draft picks. Not because it's a bad thing. You have to do it. But every time that you make a trade, you spend a draft pick, you sign a mega deal, you, whether you like it or not, you are closing a particular road or avenue to the team that you're building. And you're locking yourself in and going, no, we're going this way. There's only certain ways you can go. And that's that's a, one thing that fans don't understand. A lot of times they just think you can sign everybody. Can't. There has to be balance on the roster, team guys on rookie and guys on second year. Can you pay the big contracts to people? Just like you said, you're you're eliminating your flexibility from the way you build your team. And to me, if I was a GM, the thing I would want going into a build is I, I want a quarterback I'm in love with. I want flexibility. And those are two things that we have right now. And I know everyone's going to want something different. Like some people are going to want more draft picks or some people are going to want, you know, the cap space. We have the cap space have some draft picks. We don't have as many draft picks as the Lions or some of these other teams, but we have the quarterback. So, I mean. Well, and this is the thing is, I mean, look, like, you know me, I love the trenches. I would love nothing more. That's why I'm shocked at the Lions' bad season. I think they've been building it the right way, but I sure, do I wish that they could have found a way to snack a legit offensive lineman? The reality is the great offensive linemen don't end up on the market without some real issue. Teron Armstead was only there because of his injury history. Exactly. And his I mean, age, you know, age and injury. And and Trent Williams was available because of the brain tumor. I mean, this is the thing is like those guys don't usually hit the market. So, yes, I guess theoretically would I have wished that they found a way to pull off a Quentin Nelson trade or something? Sure. But the reality is that I'm looking at the situation and going, okay, go ahead and spend that second round pick. It doesn't lock you into a position in the draft. And you still have a ton of other holes elsewhere. Go ahead and fill those other holes. Wide receivers, you know this, Swifty. They're not cheap. Go ahead and try to acquire. I mean, who are you going to acquire? This is and look, I'm not. I mean, one of the other, one of the biggest possibilities, I was Alvin Ridley, and he's off the board now. When I looked at guys that were available next, there's a lot of people want to like say T Higgins and DJ Moore, but the Panthers and Bengals don't have to trade those guys, and I don't think the Bengals will trade T Higgins. I wouldn't. That offense is different without him so mm -hmm. they can afford to pay him i mean that's that's their whole team is built around and that's what i'm offense. saying is like you the the pick and the investment for this type of player like i said the context is important you're getting extra time with him to build with your quarterback and if for nothing else thank god the chicago bears are starting to come into the 21st century where they're decided we don't have to pay an off-ball linebacker 25 million and ask our quarterback to be captain save an offense every week and this is the good news and this is what i was telling you as much as i'd love an offensive line the one thing that we've clearly established throughout these eight or nine games however long it's been is that justin fields can absolutely find a way to squirm out of the pocket break sacks juke some dude out of his socks that he's about to get hit on on a naked bootleg find a way out the and guy then that where can is, make this where's the shortcoming better. swifty the weapons around him because he gets out and then he's like oh shit nobody and that is open. one I thing like i, I saw this there. this is something i saw multiple times i only watched the all 22 of chase claypool's last three games and all of those were with kenny pickett i didn't get to see much of him with mitch but one of the things i saw is when kenny pickett would go to roll out of the pocket and try to escape pressure 80 percent of the time he gets clobbered he doesn't get away because he didn't have the mobility. But when you watch Chase Claypool, he's getting open. That guy did not stop. He'd be running across her. And in the time, as he's running across, right, this is the quarterback going to roll out. As he's rolling out, he's breaking his route up down the sideline. 
parallel to where that quarterback's running out. If Fields has a guy doing that when he's rolling out, he's going to launch the ball down there and hit him. Because yeah. almost every time, Claypool is wide two, open. He doesn't require two gloves to build the ball 25 <laughs> yards, is what you're saying. Um, he's not like Scary Movie 2. This is my strong hand. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I get it. And this is the thing is I can watch. I've seen it. It's on tape. Justin Fields can escape all that pressure. And then we always go, well, what happened? Why didn't it work out? He escaped. But, oh, man, he had to throw the ball away. Or, oh, he took a sack because nobody was opening up or because he didn't feel confident that there was a guy he could actually take a chance throwing the ball to because he didn't know if Equinemius or Nikhil Harry or Dante Pettis would actually go up and win him a ball. And we've seen tape of that too. Dante Pettis is dropping balls in the Vikings game. Nikhil Harry is basically, I mean, look, he's got one touchdown and it's been limited action. Equinemius St. Brown has not shown to be a ball winner. Ask yourself this, Swifty. And look, I'm not here to tell you it was a great ball. Justin Fields opens up the game throwing double goes and it ends up going short. And I literally watch Equinemius come back, and it kind of hits his hands, and it drops. Oh, that play! I know what you're talking about. I mean, oh. I'm not telling you the. Look, I haven't seen Playpool it on tape. Catches I mean, that. Playpool, Playpool finds Playpool a way catches. to find. That's what I'm saying. Like, this is the thing: is I've when, seen when you see him. I mean, when you see a guy that can do, and he he not only done it once, but I've seen him do it two or three times, where defenders facing him, and he plays the defender to make him think that the ball's going high, and then. Last second, he shows the late hands, the body control. Like he's he's in positions where like he's literally parallel to the ground as he and, and he's looking up like this as he's falling. Like it's just something you don't see often from receivers. A lot of times you see it like Valus Jones. Some guys just don't have that coordination, and when they go, you know, it's just not there. And Claypool's a guy who has elite body control, well as athleticism. Speed, well, physicality, and he's violent. He's bursty. Oh. Like, that's the thing is he's explosive. He's wound up tight, and that's good. The reason, I mean, when you think about, like, look, you know me. I loved Alec Pierce. Even I can admit where Alec Pierce struggled is that he's a big receiver. He doesn't have that burst. He, the, he has the yeah, long he speed. A, yeah, well, he gets he, a little sloppy stride. getting in and, out of his, in and yeah. out of his breaks. It's hard for him to break down, sink the hips, be compact, get in and out tightly. He'd actually fall over on a lot of those because it's hard for his big frame to do that. Chase Claypool is wired so tight and so bursty that even at 235 pounds, he can do that. That's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not, I'd love to tell you I coined the name Mapletron. Like, that was what they were calling him because this is a DK thing. DK also is freaky. He's wound tight. He's built like a bodybuilder. And then, look, the whole criticism with him is, oh, he only runs goes, posts, curls outs and slants and then this year he's running the entire route tree because despite that heavy big frame he is wound so tightly that he can break down sink his hips get you can in sink and out your hips brain. and move like that it's just it's an ability that special huh? and you can get those guys that are tall and lanky that can do it like justin hunter out of tennessee was a good example i can brandy moss was one of the greatest of all time and he was a little short uh, not shorter but skinnier and lanky he oh, could yeah. do it yeah. the difference and this is kind of to now to wasn't nearly as big but t this is the this is the difference when you have guys like dk or chase claypool not only are they wound tight and bursty that they can do that but because of the mass on their frame they are able to contest press coverage and beat them off. And because of the long speed, you're daring a DB to play you press on a 230, 40 pound frame. And by the way, if you miss or I beat your press, I've got 4 4 speed and I'm bursty. You're not catching me. That's the biggest thing. And it's it's not just, that's what he adds that Nikhil Harry doesn't. We touched on it. He has the size, the physicality, and the 4 4 speed to stretch the field. That's where he's the prototypical X receiver, and that's where he just adds something to the offense that we simply have not had. Defenses, I'm, I'm not trying to take a shot at Equinemius St. Brown, but defensive coordinators, <laughs> they don't care about Equinemius St. Brown. No. When they're coming at our offense, they're game planning for Darnell. Talking about game planning for David Montgomery and now even Khalil Herbert and Justin but that is one of the reasons why defensive ends have just sat there and have spies paint on these edges and be ready for Justin rollouts because there's not much on this offense that scared them. And we just got Nikhil Harry back. So that the 
power slot. We haven't even had that. So that's just now getting here. And then we're adding the dynamic receiver on the outside. And I think that's where it's just dead on. And like, it's like, I'm just, it's so picture perfect to me that Ryan Poles, his vision of this team, I see it coming together when I see that offense. I see Nikhil Harry, Darnell Mooney, Ace Claypool in the X. Justin Fields, I see a dynamic offense. Because, like, let me ask you this, Swifty, and I'm serious. I mean, enlighten me if you can think of somebody I can't. When I'm And I'm being generous. I love me some DJ Moore. When you think about who else was out there in the trade market, potentially in the trade market, I think the only other two guys I would consider that were built like this, and they're still not this. This is what I'm saying. Claypool is a little different. But as far as that X big ball winner receiver, it was Denzel Mims and maybe Terrace Marshall. Yep. Like, who else were you potentially going to trade for to fill this role? And I believe that, too, because the people, I mean, there, there's the hypotheticals like the T. Higgins that I've already said not happening. Um, Calvin Ridley was not that guy. And I, I put Calvin Ridley the same as DJ Moore, kind of. They're, they're different receivers. Completely. I think DJ Moore can a lot. Um, he doesn't have to be Calvin Ridley's. But... Those guys are not what we needed for this offense. Me, if I'm trading away draft capital, why DJ Moore was never realistic to me, because I'm not trading away draft cap for a guy that doesn't change the dynamic of the offense. Because DJ Moore, yes, he's a good receiver, but what is he doing that changes our offense? Because that's the thing is like I look, I love DJ Moore, I love Calvin Ridley, I love Elijah Moore. I mean, they're playing of these guys, but that was the reason. And if you didn't want to take the big second round swing on Claypool, that's why I was like, hey, go take a flyer on a Denzel Mims or a Terrace Marshall if they're available. I had mentioned but, Terrence Marshall. The thing with Terrence Marshall is I didn't think the Panthers after they traded Robbie Anderson, I was mm -hmm. like, he's a guy who's young, still on his rookie deal, and they have they've been giving him targets. He's been getting three to four targets a game now. I was like, this is a guy they probably, Denzel Mims. yeah, they want to see what he's got now. So, and then Denzel Mims, I'm just not as high on him as some people are. I, I think he's a guy who, I get, if we could have, if we could have threw a six round pick for Denzel Mims and taken a flyer on him, maybe, but I'm, he doesn't change the offense. I mean, he may, he gives you a guy that maybe brings you that, but I'm, I'm not as high on Denzel. Mims. But this is why I'm, and this is why I'm excited because, Look, you you know me, Swifty. I've been as critical in Ryan Poles as I can, but I try to be fair. If I'm going to be critical and say something I don't like about it, I'm going to applaud the guy and give him all of the roses when he does something I agree with. And to me, this is what I look at is I'm tired of the half-measure bullshit. And i got to be honest, this is and what I feel what like. That's what Denzel Mims felt like to me. Is, well, is that's, guy, that is what Denzel Mims felt It's a half-measure. It's not a guy who answers the question. Mm -hmm. It's a guy, and this is what Claypool's not, and this is what I want to put. What Denzel Mims was, the guy who didn't work at another place, and they're giving him away because he hasn't worked at the NFL level. He didn't have success. Chase Claypool has had success. And, and that's been what good. this entire core has built, been built out of. And that's why I said I'm done with the half-measure bullshit. Nikhil Harry didn't work. Okay, well, let's try it out and see if we can find a jewel. Oh, Dante Pettis has been in a few places, but maybe it'll turn out. Equanimity is like... Look, I understand we all want a good story. All those guys, all David them. Moore, Tajay Sharp, like pretty yeah, much like, everyone we brought in, Byron Pringle, were guys who they have a lot of potential and they could be that guy, but none of them were for sure answered. That is Claypool. We know what we're getting with Claypool. It's not like, mm -hmm. well, we're going to hope this guy can do this even though he couldn't do it in another place. This is a guy who had success when he didn't get the target share. He Dude. wasn't the number one guy. Two weeks ago, two weeks ago, he was showing what he had. That game-winning touchdown. I mean, this yeah. is and yeah. Pickett got hurt. Mitch came in, and all of a sudden, he starts going to this guy. This is the thing. And and oh man, he wasn't producing. Yeah, he's playing for Matt Canada, who's arguably the new Matt Nagy this year on offense. And then you're sitting there. And they want to sit there and try to drive the ball to Deontay Johnson. I like Deontay Johnson. And you'll hear all these people talk about Claypool with the drop issues. And I'm going, it's funny that they want to talk about Claypool's drop issues when Deontay Johnson is Mr. Butterfingers on that offense. They, I mean, this is the thing. you got to look at that offense, that, that receiver core, and realize you've got to feed Pat, Pat Fryermuth, Chase Claypool, George Pickens, Deontay Johnson, Calvin Austin. Najee Harris. 
Yeah, Najee Harris, uh, Miles Boykin. Chase, Chase Claypool didn't have a spot, and even on those limited snaps, was finding a way to bail his quarterback out and make his quarterback right time and time again. And that's that the is biggest not issue. What, yeah. That's not what Fields has had. And this is what I'm saying, like, no more half measures. Whether you, you like or hate the cost, this was Ryan Poles finally saying, I am betting on Justin Fields. We are changing this identity of we're defense, defense, defense. I am sick of watching this quarterback have to be Superman just to try to keep us in games. If the dam, if the defense is the dam that's always going to bust and break, then I'd rather get into shootouts and give Justin a fighting chance than put all the resources into the defense and say, ah, shit, the defense, the dam bust. <laughs> Justin, save us with depleted talent and try to keep up. That's, that's the exactly biggest. I, I, what think happened you, this week. I think you nailed it there is – um, half measures was, uh, I mean, that's not the word I would use. I think he took a lot of ch- shots on guys who could potentially help us, but none of them, Byron Pringle was the closest thing to a sure thing that we brought in. He's never been, been hurt. I mean, I, I think the way to phrase it that I'm looking for is top three we- or top go-to weapon in an offense. I guess that's how I'll phrase it. Guy that consistently go to game in and game out every team has though the bears haven't had that darnell mooney's the only guy kind of consistent on the offense he hasn't been he can't be because he's coverage is always over he's also learning a new offense I, I i've seen a couple times on film this year where i think mooney ran the wrong route something he wasn't supposed to do that's because he's you he's trying to get open this offense requires them to sometimes do things to get the safety and help someone else get open. And I think Claypool's going to help Darnell Mooney. Just enormous. But the thing that we were missing, the guys who, other than Darnell Mooney, who can do it occasionally, help your quarterback make a play when the quarterback has to throw up a ball that's, you know, a 50-50 ball or something like that. Or we're in third down and he throws a ball that you know you might have to reach a little bit for or maybe run a little bit. Ryan Griffin not helping him out. ESB not helping him out on the drops. Um, Dante Pettis having balls bounce through. And happening all year, guys who just don't help quarterback. That's what you nailed it on that. Claypool's been doing that even in his limited opportunity. See him on film making standout plays help his quarterback. And Justin Fields is going to love this. Make the quarterback right. And that's the thing, is we haven't had any of those guys outside of the one-off, you know, Darnell Mooney mossing a guy against Minnesota, trying to think if there anything other. I mean, trying Ajay to be Sharp honest, in preseason? <laughs> I, I guess that was it. Like, And this is the thing, that's what I'm saying. I'm, I know it comes across harsh on Ryan Poles. I'm not even against this whole, like, I'm going to take measured swings. I want to commend the man because he has enough wherewithal and gumption to look in the mirror and say, I tried it this way. It clearly hasn't worked out. I now need to pull a 180 and do what's right for the quarterback. And Swift, I mean, this is a different topic, but this has, to me, been my biggest, like, what are we doing? How can you this not be hypocritical? The man comes to every press conference and says, I have to do what's right for the Chicago Bears. Well, what is right for the Chicago Bears is ensuring that the guy that they spent two first-round picks and a fourth-round pick works out. I don't care if you didn't draft him. I don't care if you felt differently. I don't care if you think he should have been taken 28th. What has happened is that the Bears took him 11th, gave up two first-round picks and a fourth to do it. It is in the Bears' best interest for that sunk cost in Justin Fields to pan out. And on top and of that, is- when you want to pair with that, not only, I mean, it's always like that. When we draft a guy in the first round, it's in our best interest. That guy does good. But he's also on the field, our highest potential player shows superstar potential. Could you imagine what the Bears offense would look like without him? My God. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what I'm it's like, looked like the last 20 years. I mean, God, <laughs> I mean, like, let's just put Nick Foles back there. Yeah. Pretty much. Put Andy Dalton. Like, look, and Andy Dalton's playing fine. We lead the league. We we we, we, uh, lead the league in most sacks. 
probably the worst off. We don't have the rushing offense we have now. One thing that nobody gets, like without Justin Fields' threat on the edge, these edge defenders standing here and letting the running backs get five, six yards upfield, that's Justin Fields. That's everyone's like, oh, that's our running game. I mean, uh, nope. That's if we didn't have Justin. You put, we saw it a little bit. I mean, uh, fans want a little parallels. We went from Mitch to Foles, and the same thing happened. They didn't really respect Mitch anywhere near as much as they respect Justin Fields, but he did provide that threat when he had a mesh point. Like the, Ed- I mean, I I seem to remember Justin Fields finding a way to use his legs in a monsoon to to scramble all the way to the left to look all the way to the far right, deliver a ball to Dante Pettis for a touchdown. Like, this is the thing. Without him at quarterback, this offense looks stale. It looks We're awful. probably 0-8. Yeah, and this is the thing is you now, and this is why I have to applaud Ryan Poles. He's clearly said, all right, kid, show me something, and then had enough gumption to go, okay, I cannot continue to, let, to hang you out to dry and be captain save an offense. Let me go get you some help. I can't fix it all in Ooh. one year. I can't. I can't look. I can. I can find you Braxton Jones in the fifth, and I can try to piece together. You know, moving Tevin to guard, and I'll try to get you know Lucas Patrick, Patrick here. And Ofield and Reef is yeah, like, better enough. And then he would. I think he had to realize is I can't. And this is the thing. And I understand a receiver is more than one position too, but it's harder for me to solve five offensive linemen when I've got maybe two that I think are probably good in Braxton and Tevin. And I'm a big Boren fan, but he hasn't looked very good this year. Look. So I can tr- pull a trade for one of them, but you're still going to have, even if that one looks solid, let's just say they they, they trade for Dalton Reisner. They're still going to have at the very least two very leaky offensive linemen that Justin Fields has to always worry about guys coming through on. Or I can take what I've learned and see that Justin Fields is able to escape consistently. And now I just need to get him the missing piece that allows Darnell Mooney to function a little better, that allows Nikhil Harry to function a little better. What does it ha- What does it do when Byron Pringle's coming back? Dante Pettis doesn't have to be the star player. Equinemius doesn't have to be the one solo guy that has some speed and is big. Like, that's the thing is this one little spark plug really reignites the entire core in a way that I don't think you could have done at tight end with a TJ Hawkinson as much as like, for example, I love that wasn't going to be that, um, you know, a Dalton Reisner or trade for Yash Nyman or something like that wasn't going to fix your problems. Nailed it on the head. And I think even to add on to that is it's one of the things I think bears fan ones who have been really pessimistic. I think the biggest worry is they still had this fear that, he was going to give up. Ryan Poles was going to give up on Justin Fields next year, and we were going to have to start over again. And people would have hated that. I believe now he's went out and added Nikhil Harry, now traded Roquan Smith. We didn't put all that money into defense, brought in a guy like Chase Claypool for the offense, showing fans, hey, I know this year might be tough because we just traded our best defense player. I'm giving you an offense that's going to be more fun to watch, and I'm making a statement, letting you know, even kind of said it in his press conference. Uh, He didn't say exactly, but watch that press conference. There's no way you don't think that Ryan Poles believes in Justin Fields. That's kind of what this statement was. Like, hey, I believe in this kid. I'm going to build around him. This is the first major piece. Wait till next season, guys. But, hey, at least we have something really fun, exciting watch the rest of the year. Well, and think about this. Like, I, I mean, I know we could, we could talk about this in circles, but I mean, when you think about the compensation, I understand it, it was the Bears pick, not the Ravens pick. But you, if let's just say we, we did it the old stale way, the old Bears regime, the old Bears mantra, defense, defense, defense. I keep Roquan Smith. I pay him the $20 million a year that he wants. I don't get a second or fifth. We're just keeping them, and I still got to figure out the receiver, so I draft a receiver in the second round. Or, and I know because everybody's so upset about the, the compensation, basically what they, they decided to do is I'm going to trade Roquan for a second so that when I go and get the receiver that Justin needs today to start building chemistry with, I haven't robbed myself of a second-round pick that I wanted to use in April. Oh, but, man, we got to pay Claypool. Yeah, 
I just sent out the guy that was going to command $20 million a year so that if Claypool pops off, I can pay him what I Roquan can afford was to pay him, yeah. Like, and we still have more than all of our... We still have all of our picks except the sixth, but we got a fourth and a fifth. We got an extra well, fourth and you netted and the fifth. You know, yeah. you know the fifth that, that they found Braxton Jones and Dominic yeah. Robinson? Yeah, yeah, that, that one? Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, that, I was that telling round. fans that... I mean, we still have... so. In the first five rounds now, we still have seven picks. Yep. So, I mean, we had eight. I mean, seven is still great. I mean, seven picks in the first five rounds, all this cap space, and now we're not. Kind of knew there was one position that no matter what happens in the off season, you kind of predict things. You can see in the future, looking over the list of potential free agents, it's always going to be, I don't know if this guy, like Orlando Brown, I, I don't know if this guy, I don't think the Chiefs. Nope. A lot of fans, their thing, they see Orlando Brown at the top of the list. I'd scratch him off because I don't think he's going to make it. And I believe that's how Ryan Poles worked, too. Because just when he talked about his draft process from last year and how they expected Kyler Gordon to not be there, yes, they scouted those guys. Yes, they had those guys placed on their board. They had them to the side because they didn't expect them to be there. And I feel like Orlando Brown will be kind of that way. But it's more about when you look at that free agent class, you know there's not going to be anybody there at wide receiver that can make a mm -hmm. difference. Offensive line, all kinds of options. You can find two guys come in and play on the offensive line, at least to be bridge players until draft picks can get better. And let's be clear. There is new, I, I, I would beg somebody to show me different. I have yet to see one single time, one single day, one single move where Ryan Poles has shown that he is willing to overpay for a draft pick, for a player in free agency. And I guess somebody could say, like, Claypool was that, and I think we've really done work to dispel that. So to me, I look at it and go, even if he wanted to sign somebody in free agency, you saw what receivers were commanding in free agency this year. You saw it. We would have had to pay huge money. So you were going to pay what, like, eight, you know, eight, $81 million or whatever to Christian Kirk? Essentially, like one of those, or thirty million or for DJ three years Chark to, or to, 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 to Schuster, to Zay Jones. Like this is the thing. So you decide to trade for Claypool. You have the money freed up from Roquan, and you can go and sit there and plug away. And look, I maybe I'm foolish for this, but I tend to believe that the former offensive lineman and Ryan Poles and Ian Cunningham, they showed it with Braxton Jones this year that they can find a guy in free agency that they're not going to have to overpay or the draft to fill those roles. And like, I mean, we're, we're, this is a separate topic, but to me, like everybody wants to slob on the knob of Jack Conklin or Orlando Brown because they got paid or in Conklin's case, he was a first round pick. I'm over here. Like, I don't know how the Packers are going to afford Yash Nyman. And Yash Nyman is a guy that was playing in place of David Bakhtiari all last year. And he's a solid, solid player. And he fills your right tackle role. No problem. And he's che not cheap, but here's the thing. You get to compete and say, you want to go over there with the Packers that may not have enough money to pay you, and they're in cap hell, and they're in flux with Aaron Rodgers, or you want to come with Luke Getze where he's actually going to give you an opportunity to start at right tackle opposite Braxton Jones, and now he's your starting right tackle. And then you can go throw money at a veteran center. You can draft a young center in the draft to take the place of Mustafa and Patrick. There are options there. True. Yeah. I mean, and we oh, – I lost my point. Um I had a point and I lost it. What were you saying right before? Oh, that the wide receivers are so freaking expensive. Like, this is the thing is, I can't sit there and tell you that you should. I've never seen him overpay for anybody. So what was he going to do in free agency? And that's another thing. Like, people think he's going to spend There's all this Something right around. There it is. Okay, no, I got it. I got it. Um, that You nailed it on the head there. One of those big points is... How Ryan Poles value players building the entire roster, not overspending on things just because he gets in his head and he likes it. That was Ace's biggest problem. Consistently overspending in free agency, overspending draft, which is something my biggest pet peeve in the world. Because I'm a I'm a draft for value guy. I'm a guy where Take a guy for value. If if there's not a guy right there on top of your board and you think you can get a comparable guy around, you trade down and get extra picks. 
Ryan Poles was a guy like, I love this guy right here, even though John Watson's on the board, Patrick Mahomes are on the board, I'm going to trade a whole bunch of picks. This guy is probably going to be here anyway, so I can move up one spot, make sure I can get him. And I'm going to do the same thing for Anthony Miller, and he's just throwing picks around and just has no no semblance of like what value it and that's where i trust ryan Foles. i love what he's able to said it we don't know everything he like when building the roster right we're, we're not inside his head we don't know the whole picture but what he's done this nine eight you know eight months whatever it's been since hired um a lot of it fits the way I would want to build this um, guys he's bringing. Not necessarily always the order he does it, but when you look at the kind of players he brings and things they do for the roster, beautiful. My last point is going on to your other point, how he flipped the offense. That's another thing that fans didn't want to, Give us any credit for hiring a defensive coach. Everybody wants to hate on a defensive coach. Let's give our defensive coach a chance to bring in players, play his defense for a lot less money. Let's see what kind of defense that guy can build. Let's spend money to bring in big talent on the offense. And I have a lot of faith in where he's going to go in the next couple of years. I mean, because this is the thing, and like I'll just give you an example name, but – Leighton Vander Esch is a guy that was drafted in Dallas when Iberflus was there. It was the year before he took off to Indy, if I'm not mistaken. He's on a one-year retainer deal with Dallas. That's a big, long, lanky linebacker that you can probably get for about one year, six, seven, eight million. Anthony Walker will be back on the market. He was the middle linebacker for the Colts when Iberflus was there. I mean, you can find a Nick Morrow, like I said, who's played to at least about the same as Roquan Smith for a fraction of the price. And this is an opportunity for them. And, and you know this, I mean, because you're a draft Nick guy. There aren't – wide receivers always deep, especially in this age. I'm not here to tell you that you don't have a lot of wide receiver options in the draft. But there are significantly, in this draft at least, more options with edge rushers and D-line and offensive line than there are with receivers, with – I mean, corner is a pretty stacked option. But, in I mean, free this agency is, as well, I mean you- – Couple them together when you go for. Want to go, ideally, what the GM wants. Want to fill your holes, agents, and attack the draft best player available. Obviously, there's always going to be give and take in that. Have Mm -hmm. some guys that are younger, some spots that are question marks. But if you can bring in, when he can bring in some big talent, free agency, not pigeonhole himself in the draft. Gonna, gonna be better for our team. That, that's what I, I just want to see a lot of talent brought in next year, and let us let him go into the draft and pack it. Well, because this is this is I mean, like we, we we touched on this a little bit, but this is so important to me. Is as I said earlier, when you decide to make particular moves, you are signifying and planting a flag in the ground that I have closed off this road. We're going down this, and this is why I'm so happy. Is I guess he could have planted the flag on Roquan Avenue and said, this is how we're going with our 20 million. And this is who's going to be our guy. And we can talk about whether he deserved it or not. I don't personally think he did. But what I saw is a guy that said, look, I know what he means and all that, but I'm going to turn that over there, open this Avenue up. And then I'm going to declare and put a flag in the ground for Chase Claypool and Justin Fields. And at least, again, as me as a fanalist, my opinion means not much, means jack shit, not much of anything. But the reality is that I would much rather see the Bears built with Justin Fields in mind and with Chase Claypool and money being pushed to the offense because we have over 100 years of money being pushed to the defense. And we've seen and it sadly, obviously isn't the way to go. No, it obviously isn't. Especially into, and, and now the even more than ever, the, how often which to take advantage of that, it's harder to specifically well, through and need is, an offense and a defense. Well, and this is the reality, and like nothing's changed with the whole defense wins championship mantra, but this isn't this isn't me pulling it out. I mean, you can go look at it with the teams that have been the most successful over the last, I believe it's three, four years, maybe it's even longer, five. They all the best teams in the playoffs always have a top five offense EPA wise. 
and that's expected points added. And this is, I mean, this is why is that? It's because they have guys like uh, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, and guess what? And I guess in Patrick Mahomes it's a little different, but we can talk about Jalen Hurts this year, the only undefeated team left, and why is his meteoric meteoric rise, why has it happened? Because, and I, I look no further than Brandon Bean. Brandon Bean, to me, is the model example citizen of a GM that surprisingly took the bills at around the same time that the Bears were at. They had to ship off a Marcel Darius, a first-round pick, top, top 10 guy at a position, and send him off for pennies on the dollar that many people thought. And, traded Reggie Ragland and other players like that. You saw this position where even he realized he tried to put a, a garbage receiver core around Josh Allen. John Brown. And then realized, yeah. <laughs> and then realized I have to go get my quarterback a legit weapon. I got to go get on Diggs. And when you look at that, I mean, he did that. In the, they traded that in the offseason. Right, that wasn't a midseason. It was, yeah, it was right before the draft. That's what yeah. ultimately got. If he uh, would have waited, Jackson. he could have got Justin Jefferson. But yeah, I um, understand. But like, but this and this is the thing is you. We can always say what if, but I will certainly take the proven. We're taking the chance, and what he did there is say, hey, I could possibly get a guy in the draft. But when you take the guarantee, the different digs was a little bit older. I mean, Claypool's only getting him at twenty. He hadn't even hit prime yet. It's perfect, but. I think you nailed it. And my, my last point, I think, is when you look at the overall roster, and how you're building the roster, I know you think about this a lot like I do. My biggest fear going into next season was just that we would go into the draft, pigeonholed that we had to take a wide receiver. I don't feel like there's another position on this roster where that could happen to. I think when I look at the roster, what I think we definitely would need for next season our starting caliber three technique and then a couple linebackers but not and then some more talent on the offensive line figure out where that's at whether jack conklin at right tackle or you want to get a guy at left guard or you want to get both you can address those in free agency and in the draft whereas getting a number one wide receiver we would have had to have taken him our first pick maybe our second pick that was it. Those were the only yeah. avenues that we had to address that. Whereas the other positions, you say starting center, we could probably get a center in the third, fourth, three, maybe even fifth round. Um, Honestly, I mean, I and this is where I mean, everybody loves John Michael Schmitz out of Minnesota, and look, I, I like him. I just and he's twenty four. I'm going to be twenty five as a rookie. I don't know if I want to go down that road yeah. again. But I mean, let's just for like those that are interested in the draft. I mean, as far as centers. Um, to be clear, I probably would prefer a veteran center, a guy that can take care of the protections for Justin because he's had to do it with himself and Sam Musty uh, for a while. But, you know, it's when you're talking about the draft, it's John Michael Schmitz out of Minnesota. He's considered center one. But then you get to guys like Jarrett Patterson, Patterson. out of Notre Dame. That's my guy. When you get to Ricky Stromberg out of Arkansas, when you get to Cedric Van Paran out of Georgia, like there are these guys at center that will be there in the second, the third, the fourth. Um, I mean, you want to talk about three techs. Everybody understands there's Jalen Carter, but you got guys like Wilson out of uh, out of Texas A and M that could be moved in. Miles Murphy that could be moved in. Brian Oswald. Bersie. He's going to go high Mozzie, too, though. Mozzie, Mozzie Smith out of Michigan. Uh, I mean, the, the the list goes on and on. You want to talk about edge rusher? Everybody knows Will Anderson, but what about Andre Carter? What about uh, now? Brenton Cox just got got uh, removed from Florida, but I mean, you can go down the list of the different edge rushers too. Like it's it's this draft, and that's I mean. We're going to go deep into that. I mean, I feel like this offseason, the draft is going to be like Christmas. Got extra picks. Mm -hmm. I kind of wish we not, not really. No, no. I want I want Clay. But, I mean, the draft is like Christmas to me. I know it's kind of like that for you. We're definitely I mean, going to go the, When's the last time we had all the draft picks? I really don't know. With a couple extra picks? We don't have our six-round pick. I keep... I, know. I mean, I, mean sure. I know we like, don't, but I mean, we had the two sevens this year. One of them's a starter. So. The way I always look at that is like, yeah, don't get me wrong. The two six or the sixth is important, but if I can easily go up the board and say, do I have a duplicate of a higher pick? Yeah. I got then two. You fourths. have all your picks. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, with one of those fourths, you could trade down three spots and mm -hmm. that was an extra six. So, yeah. Holes already showed his ability to do that, even though we always wanted pace. That's one of those things I've always wanted move down and acquire more picks in a draft especially when you have the opportunity and 
if there was anything about the last draft I wanted more is I wished he would have done it one of our first three picks. Obviously, after getting Brisker and Gordon, I didn't want it in the first two. I would have liked to seen if there was anything there in the third round, but I love having a GM that wants to stockpile extra picks, not that just wants to throw them around for this one guy he falls in love with. This is a guy who trusts his board. That's where it always is. is trust your draft board. As a as a the NFL draft guy over the year, say is nobody's going to be right a hundred percent of the time. Never. That's why when you do it with the way Pace did, set yourself up for failure. Giving away extra shots you have at winning the lottery. They're like lottery tickets, mm-hmm. kind of. I mean, I, I mean, and when you're when you're saying I'm going to take ten lottery tickets because this lottery ticket has a cooler number. That's what Ryan Pace would do. And the fact that Ryan Poles sees the value and is like, oh, you know what? I'm just going to stockpile and get extra picks. That is what I love going forward, and I, I couldn't be more excited. Yeah, no, I agree with you, Swift. I mean, that's that's the reality of it, too, is don't get me wrong. Ryan Pace certainly hit on quite a few picks, especially at that. It almost like it was a beautiful parting gift getting Tevin Jenkins and Justin Fields. But, I mean, you also have to realize that you're taking those individualized swings. And even if they, let's just give you the benefit of the doubt. Even if you hit on every single pick when you're trading multiple to get them, you cannot restock the roster, the meat, the protein, the the connective tissue of the roster with cheap players because you're literally giving away your cheap contracts with draft picks. That's a problem. And now you have to fill it with with free agents. And now you're filling it with, and now you're giving away comp picks. So you end up with this roster. It's that's a cycle how- that the Bears were always in because we never hit on our draft pick. We never built the roster correctly with depth. So every year in free agents, we'd be overspending because we had to. Because mm-hmm. one, we didn't have the draft pick to even try hitting the draft because he had already traded those away most of the time. Then two, it, we were in a win now mode because. The front office always wanted to be in win out mode, no matter what our roster looked like. We're gonna throw all our money, win in as many games a week. Yeah, you gotta go the sign Trey, Trey Burton, Taylor Gabriel, uh, Tra- Danny Tra- blah, blah, Dan- blah. Danny Trevathan, haha Clinton Dix. I mean, it was just cut Tishon Gibson twice. I mean, that was a, Tishon Gibson's a great example. It was a guy that was a budget ad at the very end. That was one that was decent yeah because that was a yeah. budget one it wasn't a guy you overspent on and he actually fit the roster better than haha ha clinton fixed it yep and it, and even then though that's one where he's literally having to scrape the bottom of the barrel at the end of at the beginning of training camp end of mini camp to find a starting strong safety because you traded away all the draft picks and you didn't have the money because you had to spend it to try to piece together nick Foles. Yep. <laughs> or you know i mean and somebody that's another else. thing just giving away draft picks on players that my God, trading a fourth round pick for holes in his contract was probably, I mean, as far as a, a move acquisition we made, probably one of my least favorite ever. Like, I mean, even taking Mitch over Watson, like all those, like it just, that was awful. Like we traded for Nick Foles. Did they give us a fourth? No, we gave them. No. Did they pay his whole contract? No. <laughs> like that was the whole thing, man. I think I, we're we're well over an hour now, Jordan. I think it was a uh, great talking with you. And always, like like I said, um, I'm I'm gonna go in big for the. I'll be, I'll be covering it, even harder than I did last year. More than welcome is always on. Do you have any final thoughts or anything to say before we? Yeah, I mean, I I just love Bears fans to try to consider these moves with a little bit more of an open mind. Hopefully this has been insightful and a little bit educational, um, at least a little bit uh, provocative in the sense of opening up those ideas and context is important. Uh, re- remain hopeful. Look, I'm not, I'm not telling you the Bears are going to win a Super Bowl this year, but I think that there's plenty of positive to be taken with Justin Fields and the way he's performed. The Bears have a tough schedule ahead. And the defense with that linebacker that nobody wanted to see uh, leave was giving up 49 points to the Cowboys. I don't know what it would have looked like giving up more than that to the Eagles and the Bills. 
at least Justin Fields gets a piece of ammo to try to fight back with now than being asked to, to save the team and deliver the team to wins with depleted talent around him. It's kind of a thing in the NFL is, is it's easier for an offense for points. Once you mm-hmm. get talent on defense, defenses are so much bigger, stronger, and faster, and giving more looks than ever to quarterbacks. But it's still, you have an offensive scheme and you have a ton of playmakers. You have a quarterback and you have playmakers, you're going to score points. It's just that simple. Well, and people don't realize, I mean, and this isn't just Bears fans, it's just fans in general, is I don't think people either realize or give enough credit to the fact of how volatile defensive outcome and efficiency is from year to year when you really I look I know it's easy to go well Dallas was good last year and they're good this year that is an anomaly more than it is it's much more of the exception than than the rule the rule often is is that the defenses the top defenses change from year to year because it's hard to maintain defensive excellence you have to have a whole unit of guys playing together yeah I mean, you want to talk about, like, well, my final point here is that if the, it's something I didn't even mention to the fans here that are listening at the end, but this is really the the crux of what I'm excited about is we've seen Eberflus and this staff be comfortable playing young talent. And the importance behind that is that we talk about, you just heard me say, the volatility of defensive efficiency is so up and down. One of the things that dictates the best defensive consistency from year to year is continuity. It's why the Bengals, and look, I understand the Bengals had a hard night the other night, but it's the reason why once you're in year two, year three of Lou Anarumo's defense, or it was Matt Eberflus year so-and-so, why is Leslie Frazier and the Buffalo Bills defense so good? Why did Jordan Poyer and, and Micah Hyde look so good together? That continuity, why did Adrian Amos and, and Eddie Jackson look that good? Justin Simmons, Kareem Jackson. This is what happens when you build that continuity And you now have Eddie Jackson maintained. He wasn't traded away. You have Jaquan Brisker. Those two get to grow together. Kyler Gordon and Jalen Johnson, if he's retained. Kendall Vildor. You are building this defense up with with continuity and connectivity in a way that you don't have to invest year in and year out to get a consistent model because they all know the language. They all know how to play together. They understand all of the different tags on defensive calls that you don't get with other schemes. That's killer, man. I love it, Jordan, man. Um, I'm I'm excited. Um, final thing, Chase Claypool, welcome to Chicago. I think we're all super excited to have you. Justin Fields, probably number one. I mean, got himself a weapon now. So national media, what's the narrative now that Justin Fields has a weapon? I don't know what's. Yeah. Maple Tron, welcome to Shy City, baby. Bear down. Hey, Bear down, Jordan. Always great talking with you, and I love your knowledge. Always a great guy to talk to. Man. Until next time, guys, bear down. Bear down. Thanks, Swifty. What's up, guys? Swift here. Cover. Oh, that's not it. It's in the normal. <laughs> that's just my line normally. Swift here covering everything Chicago. Okay.